let us begin. So the topic that we have taken up for discussion today on the first Avalog Lecture Forum is where we mark the 90th anniversary of Universal Franchise in Sri Lanka. Universal Franchise was introduced back in 1931. It was a momentous occasion, and we're going to hear much more about it from our renowned guest lecturer uh, who's going to be speaking to us uh, this evening. Uh, but before we move into that, I would like to introduce our guest lecturer. She is someone who actually needs very little introduction. Dr. Jane Russell graduated from the University of Oxford. She received a Commonwealth scholarship. And very interestingly, the recipients of Commonwealth scholarships usually, from a Sri Lankan perspective, look to moving to the United Kingdom or Australia or Canada or New Zealand or elsewhere. But Jane, on that occasion, decided on Sri Lanka and she came to the University of Peradeni where she read for her doctorate in political history from the University of Peradeni. Her seminal work uh, on that occasion, uh, which resulted in publication of a book as well, uh, titled Communal Politics on the Dolomo Constitution, 1931 to 1947, uh, remains a okay, but now when it comes to in Sri Lanka. Uh, and uh, Jane, if you would permit me, uh, I must... There's a box um, like on top that we that the big director at the time of the Institute of Commonwealth Studies at the University of London who noted the work shows the benefits of commitment combining as it does intimate insight into the complexities, ah, yes, style, the that. flavors of Sri Lankan politics as a facet of that society, yeah. the broad historical That's understanding of world movements okay, of ideas okay. and ideas. And Jane herself, uh, when she undertook this research. Uh, also noted the fact of contribution that can be gotten out of a country like Sri Lanka, uh, where she said, and I'll leave her to expand on this later on too, uh, when she talked about research in Sri Lanka. And uh, you mentioned that uh, the problem which often besets Western scholars, that of having to scratch around for a faithful avenue of research is not the case in Sri Lanka. Here there is an exuberant socio-cultural vegetation. The problem is one of digestion. And with that, Jane, I would like to invite you to speak to us. Uh, you've done an intensive study of the end of British period in Ceylon. You've also uh, authored the publication, Our George, which is a biography of George E. De Silva, who served as Minister of Health in the 1940s. And we hope to take that up in the Q&A as well. Um, over to you, Jane. Thank you very much, George. Right. Okay, the title of my lecture today is Complexities of Governance and Policy, the 90th Anniversary of Universal Franchise in Sri Lanka. I am greatly honoured to be asked by the AwareLog Initiative to speak at their lecture forum in this year of 2021, celebrating the 90th anniversary of the advent of Universal Franchise to Sri Lanka. In my lecture, I shall touch on some of the complex problems of governance and policy faced by a small multi-ethnic island, flanked oh, and always has been. Hello, there's someone who is intervening every now and then into what, into our conversation. Sorry about that. Muted, yeah, who needs to be muted. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I shall touch on some of the complex problems of governance and policy faced by a small multi-ethnic island, flanked as it is and always has been by economic and political superpowers. Today, I want to briefly re re revisit the grant, and in using that word, I have already encountered a problem, one that I shall look at later, of universal franchise to Sri Lanka, then called Ceylon, nine decades ago. But I am not so much interested in Ceylon's perspective of getting universal franchise, as I covered that ground in my book. As an activist historian, I am now more interested in the motives of the British overlords, in particular the colonial office during the 1927-31 period in giving Ceylon a universal franchise. Why did the colonial office send out those particular Donamore commissioners? Why did the Donamore commission decide that universal franchise and the executive committee system of government was the most appropriate to foster successful self-government in Sri Lanka? Why did the Commission even want to foster democracy and self-government in an imperial dependency? These are the questions I shall now try to answer. I should also like to make one disclaimer. In this brief lecture, I use the term Ceylon, British Ceylon and Sri Lanka almost interchangeably. 
There is some vague method in my usage based loosely on the date 1948, although that is in itself arbitrary, as it was in January 1973 when I first arrived in the island to take up a Commonwealth scholarship at Peridenia that Sri Lanka, the name of the new republic, came into existence. If you find it at all confusing, I apologize in advance, but I would ask you to bear with me. In the end, it is the island of Lanka, Taprobane, Serendib that I am talking about and no other. First, I want to make it clear in discussing universal franchise as the basis for democracy that I am in complete agreement with wartime British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, who stated in 1947 at the end of the last global war, that many forms of government have been tried and will be tried in this world of sin and woe. No one pretends that democracy is perfect or all wise. Indeed, it has been said that democracy is the worst form of government, except for all those other forms that have been tried from time to time. Democracy is, and I quote here from the Merriam-Webster American English Dictionary, Government by the people, especially A, rule of the majority, and B, a government in which the supreme power is vested in the people and exercised by them directly or indirectly through a system of representation usually involving periodically held free elections. This otherwise acceptable definition is strangely wanting in one respect. It does not specify who the people are. That is, it does not state the criteria for deciding who may be eligible to vote. Nowhere does it state the age, race, the language, birthplace, religion, gender, the sexual preference, the educational standard, wealth or property, skin color, or indeed any other discriminator determining who can vote in an election. From the turn of the 21st century, the USA, which has long prided itself on its democratic norms and indeed parades its democratic institutions as a model for other countries to follow, has come up against powerful geo-economic and political forces that do not recognize democracy as a particularly valid form of government, and certainly not one that trumps their own forms of governance. Whether those challenging the primacy of democracy are from one-party states, or one-person dictatorships, or indeed violent anti-establishment Islamic religious movements like the Taliban, Islamic State, or Boko Haram, these challenges are undermining US confidence in its democratic exceptionalism to the point where it is finding that its earlier, easy accommodation with elections and voting now under threat internally from anti-democratic proto-authoritarians like Donald Trump. The US political culture is now faced with a dilemma which covertly has always dogged its democratic credentials, of deciding whether non-white members of its populace, and more specifically, the black and or mixed descendants of formerly enslaved peoples, have a right to vote equal to those who consider themselves truer Americans because of their paler skin and non-slave background. Another reason I chose the Merriam-Webster definition of democracy is because it boldly states that democracy is government based on rule by the majority. And this is where Sri Lanka's 90-year experience of universal franchise becomes so historically valuable. When the Donamore commissioners came to British Ceylon in 1928, they were acutely aware that the political turbulence caused by the October 1917 revolution in Russia had changed the world forever. The commissioners came to Ceylon from a Britain where the more left-wing representatives in parliament and government had already started to realize that the political and economic costs of maintaining empire were escalating to a point where it was becoming more rational to let empire go rather than try to hang on to it. An Edinburgh-trained medic and holder of the military cross, Dr. Thomas Drummond Shields was appointed as a Donamore commissioner by the newly appointed Secretary of State for the Colonies, Sidney Webb, who'd just been brought into frontline politics by being made a peer, Lord Passfield, by the Labour Party, who were in government in Britain in a coalition with the Liberals for the very first time. Webb was a neo-Marxist and a great admirer of the Soviet Union. He knew Drummond Shields, his fellow traveling Marxist and equally fierce anti-imperialist, would definitely become the intellectual driving force behind the commission, which had been tasked to find a new constitutional settlement for British Ceylon. Privately, Drummond Shields was instructed by Webb to use this opportunity to find some constitutional process, an institutional mechanism which would serve as a precedent 
and so allow the government in London to dispose of their imperial possessions and responsibilities in a manner both politically practicable and ethical, but also as timely as possible. Ceylon was therefore chosen to be a laboratory for an experiment in not quite, but almost self-government. A self-government which would lead not to outright independence, but dominion status, the same status accorded within the empire to Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and South Africa, that is the white dominions. And here we can see the white supremacist basis which underpinned the British empire and which would inevitably lead to its demise a demise which neo-Marxist politicians in Britain in the 1930s could clearly envision, though without discerning how it might happen. It seems that Ceylon was considered the perfect vehicle for this attempt at seven-tenths self-government, so-called because three British colonial civil servants sitting in the Colombo Parliament or State Council served as ministers of finance, foreign affairs and internal security, while all other ministerial posts were given to elected state councillors. But why did the leftists in the colonial office think Ceylon so well suited for democratic development? Well, for one, British Ceylon was insulated from the influence of India and its other South and Southeast Asian neighbors by its crown colony status. Please allow me to digress a little here and explain something about crown colonies. These were special entities within the empire. They were usually small islands, for example, Hong Kong, Bermuda, Jamaica, and the Falklands. But Ceylon was considered the premier crown colony. Why? Well, it was wealthy from its trade, from the trade of its tea, rubber, and coconut plantations. It had a two and a half thousand year plus history of Buddhist civilization. It did not have any large urban centers dominated by a plutocratic class where revolution might be seeded. The population density was low and the literacy rate was higher than in any other non-white imperial territory, and English education amongst the elite was widespread. Generally speaking, women had property and marriage rights equal to men. It had putative trade unions, a recognizable political party, the Ceylon National Congress, and the white, mostly British, but what was deemed European plantation-owning class was small, unlike, say, in Kenya or Uganda. To British leftist eyes, Ceylon was a recognizably westernized country ripe for fully-fledged democracy. Yet it also had all the complexities associated with other Indo-Asian political cultures, caste division, racial, religious and language divisions, differing climatic zones, tribal peoples. In short, Ceylon seemed a society that could be used as a model for future constitution constitutional settlements not just in other crown colonies, but for all imperial possessions, including the crown jewel of empire, India. The Donnamore Commission was therefore sent to Ceylon in 1928 as the harbinger of imperial divestment. Its job was to write the template for the leaving card of British empire. The institutional insulation of British Ceylon from its neighbors was an important element in this constitutional experiment. British India, which included today's Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Burma, was administered from London by the India office, a completely separate department to the colonial office, which looked after Ceylon. Of course, the position of Indian Tamils, nowadays referred to as upcountry Tamils in Sri Lanka and Highland Tamils in India, was anomalous because they were in effect dual citizens of both British Ceylon and British India. Although having said that, they were, along with the least liberated caste groups of the Sinhalese and Tamil communities, the poorest educated, lowest paid, and worst housed segment of the island's population. But they were also one of the most commercially valuable groups as it was from their labor that the bulk of foreign exchange earned from the plantation economy was generated. However, because British India had no administrative input into Ceylon's governance, this group could be disenfranchised willy-nilly under the Donnamore settlement, which is what happened as soon as the commissioners had left. Imagine how impossible this disenfranchisement might have been if India had been a sovereign nation in 1931. Imagine as well how Indian politics might have become enmeshed with Sri Lankan politics if India had been able to have a say in the writing of the Donnamore constitution. Isn't it likely that India would have claimed Ceylon as a natural part of India? Just think about it. If things had been otherwise, British Ceylon might have been casually handed to British India, as Hong Kong was to China in 1997, as a gift from one empire to another. I shall now return to my narrative. 
Significantly, Drummond Shields was the only Donnamore commissioner to have had experience of serving as an elected councillor on London County Council, the LCC. In 1929, there were 148 councillors and aldermen elected by universal franchise to the LCC. London in the decade after the First World War was a city of 8 million people and owing to its position as the metro metropolis of empire was as cosmopolitan as it is today. From 1919, all London residents, including women, had the right to vote and stand in LCC elections. In fact, many women were elected as London councillors in the 1920s. Moreover, a, no moreover, a number of South Asians ran in the lower tier of local borough elections, some of whom were elected. When I interviewed Doric D'Souza many years ago, he told me he'd been elected as a local borough councillor while living in London as a young man. London local elections were therefore ethnically diverse and incorporated a female franchise. The LCC was also a prestigious political institution. It had a huge budget raised from property rates and enormous responsibilities. Although a municipal agency, London's government was larger than that of many countries. Councillors served on executive committees overseeing housing, education, transport, road, social welfare, health, sanitation, police, fire brigade, courts and justice, etc., etc. Executive committees, as anyone who has ever served on the EC of a sports club knows, are vehicles for cooperative management. The three political parties represented in the LCC were offshoots of the Liberals, the Conservatives and the Labour Party. On their chosen ECs, councillors from different parties and representing very different electorates, from the slums of the East End to the mansions of Mayfair, had to cooperate to make London governance work. London was therefore a microcosm not just of Great Britain, but of the empire as a whole. Together with the Webbs, Sidney and Beatrice, and Leonard Wolfe, the ex Ceylon civil servant, husband to novelist Virginia, who by 1927 had become a pivotal backroom thinker on the Labour Party's Foreign Policy Committee, Drummond Shields sketched out a plan to introduce London's electoral and governmental system into British Ceylon. This left wing brains trust thought universal franchise, together with an executive committee system of governance, would produce stable self government in Ceylon. They hoped that this would then give the lie to imperialists in Britain, politicians like Churchill, Chamberlain and other Tory grandees, plus Lord Rothermere and his fellow right-wing press barons who were mouthpieces of the financiers and corporate shareholders who had gained so much from empire, when they argued that peoples of the non-white British colonies and imperial possessions were incapable of running their own affairs. And this was not a forlorn hope. If you look at the constitutional settlement in Northern Ireland today, enacted after the Good Friday Agreement of 1998, it is made up of an electoral system of large multi-member constituencies incorporating neighbourhood Protestant and Catholic communities, which use the single transferable vote system of proportional representation and the Daunt procedure for awarding seats in the Northern Ireland Assembly. It is a mechanism something like the Duckworth Lewis method used in cricket. It ensures fair proportionality given the fact that no Catholic will vote for a Protestant and no Protestant will vote for a Catholic. The system of government involves an executive committee at its head and a mandatory coalition in which the first minister is always drawn from the Protestant majority and the deputy minister from the Catholic minority. If one resigns, the other is constitutionally forced to resign as well. This form of power sharing, also known as co-associational democracy, was not devised by a Britisher at all, but by a Belgian, Arendt Lipat, for societies emerging from conflict or for those with potential for conflict. Switzerland, Belgium and the Lebanon also employ the co-associational model. If you study the Donnemore Constitution, you will find that it is a forerunner of this model of democracy. However, because it used the first-past-the-post voting system, which in 1931 31 was virtually the only recognised system of voting, it led to a situation where the Singhalese majority in the State Council were able to prevent the Tamil, Muslim and Berger councillors getting any real administrative power, and so undermined the power-sharing idea behind its composition. If, and this is the last of my many ifs, the Donnemore constitution had been combined with proportional representation, plus a greater constituency weightage for minority areas, the executive committee system might still be in use in Sri Lanka. The commissioners had tried to design a system for Ceylon 
that would prevent conflict arising from the permanent Sinhalese majority in parliament that universal franchise would engender. They tried to invent a system of democratic government that would fit Ceylon, Sri Lanka, like a glove. They failed. And their failure has resulted in civil war and economic underachievement. For let me be clear, universal franchise was not something demanded by anyone in the Sinhalese, Tamil or Muslim communities. Neither George E. De Silva nor A. E. Gunasinghe, who were the most insistent that the franchise be extended, thought of asking for or indeed expected to get even a full male franchise. They argued for a franchise for males over the age of 21 resident in Ceylon who had at least had a primary education, i.e. men who could read and write, at least in the vernacular. What they got was beyond their wildest dreams and indeed was the stuff of nightmares for all other representatives of Low Country and Kandy and Sinhalese, Ceylon Tamil, Muslim and other communities consulted by the commission. Only the representatives of the Indian Tamil community for obvious reasons were in favor of full male franchise regardless of educational, of any educational element. No one, and I repeat, no one, except perhaps George E. De Silva's wife Agnes and a few of her Colombo female friends argued for any form of votes for women. Messrs De Silva and Gunasinger, to give them their due, supported their wives in asking for equal votes for women. But again, what was asked for was votes for educated women. This brings me back to the word which I used in my opening remarks and which seems so problematic. That is the grant of universal franchise to Ceylon in 1931. The word grant suggests that the people of Ceylon were demanding and lobbying for universal franchise in the late 1920s. Nothing could be further from the facts. What most of the political and commercial elite of the island wanted and asked for when the commission came was a slight extension of the existing very, prescript, very prescriptive male franchise. What they got in universal franchise destabilized the island's political culture immediately. It led to the Jaffna boycott, the pan Singhala Board of Ministers, and the final rejection by all commun communities of the Executive Committee system in favour of the Westminster model of parliamentary government, which, has pro which proved even more unsuitable and has now been replaced by a French model. Universal franchise was foisted on Ceylon in 1931. In the minds of its authors, it was a necessary act done for the greater good of the world, it was done to rid the world of the racial and political injustice of empire while maintaining democratic values and governance in former imperial entities and as an exemplar for modern governance throughout the globe. And overall, looking back, one might argue that it has, generally speaking, worked. India is still the largest functioning democracy in the world. Ghana and to a lesser extent Nigeria and Kenya are functioning democracies in Africa. We'll leave out Hong Kong as it's a special case, but Jamaica and other islands of the uh, Caribbean have stuck with democratic norms. Burma is trying to get democracy back after decades of military rule. Pakistan and Bangladesh swing between democracy and army takeovers, but they seem to always want to return to democratic ways and oftentimes do. South Africa has, after decades, overturned minority race government in favor of majority rule. There are dreadful failures, of course. Nigeria and Uganda have been through terrible periods of bloodletting, and Uganda, like Kenya, oversaw mass deportations of unwanted Asians. The Lebanon is sadly, and through no fault of its own, a basket case, and the Israeli-Palestine issue is still a running sore on the world's body politic. But Ceylon's contribution to world history in taking on universal franchise, unasked and probably prematurely, yet making it work so well for so long has resulted in perhaps a fairer and more equal world than I might otherwise have been the case. And that's the end. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jane, for that uh, reflection where you not only uh, looked at the context in which Ceylon gained uh, universal franchise and was granted it, or you used the word oystered on Ceylon at the time, uh, but you also reflected on uh, several other situations. And one that is particularly uh, interesting and a point that I think we need to take up in the Q&A as well is the um, hypothetical situation, of course, uh, but the reflection on the fact that India was not independent at that point. 
which is a very, very critical factor. This could have become, as you said, another Hong Kong. Uh, this could have been the case. Um, I, I just want to launch into a question first, but let me also ask our participants, uh, if you would like to ask a question, please put it in the chat box. We will be taking it from the chat box. Uh, please feel free to write your question there and we will um, 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 field your questions. Um, Jane, if I were to just um, go into one particular area, you talked about A.E. Gunasinghe, you talked about Georgie De Silva as well. Um, you also say that um, they were willing to go ahead with it uh, if universal franchise was subject to literacy and low income qualification. Uh, you also say people like Ramanathan, plus most of the conservatives at the time, um, believed and argued that the giving of the vote to the non Vellala caste and to women was not only a grave mistake leading to mob rule, but Ramanathan especially suggested it was an anathema to the Hindu way of life. And that's on one side. Whilst you also say the Sinhalese leaders were also very dubious about the new franchise, but they were willing to support it in a quid pro quo for the abolition of communal um, electorates. Now, when you look at that bigger picture, it seems like we didn't want it in 1931. There was, um, except as you mentioned, Mrs. De Silva and Mrs. Gunasekara, who may have spoken on behalf of women and wanting them to get it as well. Uh, if, you, if you could just reflect on that particular aspect there, was it because we were not aware of what it entailed? Was it something too new for us? Why was there a degree of resistance? What do you think was the main reason for that from Ceylon? Mm. Ceylon in 1931 was still a country, a nation of villages. Um, and it had right in the middle this enormous plantation sector, which was largely owned by Europeans um, and which generated a lot of the money, which um, enabled um, Sri Ceylon to become modern with railways and roads and vehicles, motor vehicles, buses and trains and so on. And so that it was in a strange position. It wanted some of the benefits that had come from empire, but it wanted it without the disadvantages, that is, without the rule by the white man, without um, being told what to do by people in London. It wanted independence, but it wanted to somehow maintain the things that it had got through empire, like roads, like railways, like the plantations, and so on. So it was in a cleft stick. It was between the devil and the deep blue sea. Could it go backwards to a more feudal area, era and have a king and stay with its village economies and its, its, its pastoral nature? No. Could it go forward and become a fully fledged nation state? Well, it appeared that it could, but in order to do that, it had to abide by the, the, the standards that the West had decided was what made a nation state. And one of those standards was that you had to have some kind of franchise, universal franchise, and some kind of parliamentary system or, or model like that. That was in 1931 what supposedly divided the world of the rulers from the world of the ruled. Um, and it didn't quite know what it wanted or whether it even wanted to even have to make a decision about it. Right? But the decision was taken for them. That's the point. The Donamore commissions made a decision, not partly for Sri Lanka, but also for what they thought of as the rest of the world, the rest of the empire. Um, and Sri Lanka, in that sense, was just um, an experiment. It was just a little laboratory, a political laboratory that was being used by these left-wing intellectuals in order to for them to be able to say to the imperialists in Britain, look, Sri Lanka, Ceylon has self-government, it is stable, it hasn't had a revolution, it hasn't um, had any riots, it hasn't thrown over the wealthy uh, class and taken over anything, it hasn't even thrown out the, the Europeans, it's a stable system, so if it works in Ceylon, it can work anywhere. And I think that the people of Ceylon realized they weren't so foolish. They realized that they were being used as guinea pigs and they weren't very happy about it. So if you say, why didn't they want it? Well, they hadn't asked for it. They didn't think they wanted it because they didn't think they were ready for that. They were thrown into it. 
right? Like the baby into the bathwater. And they had no choice. It was given to them unasked. Um, some of them were far more right-wing than others. I mean, Ramanathan was a very old man by that time. He had become so right-wing, so sort of, I mean, it, it, most Jaffna Tamils had, had very little in common with, with Ramanathan in 1931, and he died soon after. So, I mean, I, quoting him is a bit unfair of me, really. He, he, he's on one extreme. Um, as for George de Silva and, and A. Gunasinger, well, they also were not just representing um, uh, male Sinhalese who wanted to get hold of the levers of power, they were also representing non Goigama male through Sinhalese who wanted to get their hands on the on the levers of power. So there was elements of caste also thrown into it. And of course, if you have one group asking for something, you can be sure that another group will not want it simply because that group is asking for it. So that was also a problem because uh, De Silva and Gunasinger wanted it, you can be sure that there were other groups who therefore thought, well, we're going to go against it because they're asking for it. So there we have it in a nutshell. It was a it was a problem. It was a dilemma, and Sri Lanka was stuck on the horns of that dilemma. Because there was even a massive difference of opinion between Manning, Governor Manning, who I think uh, in the early 1930s, when he wrote about it, he um, he said that um, Ceylon, um, an organisation of society, is communal, uh, whereas the commissioners had a different view, and um, they thought that. Uh, the political divisions of the West, which were based on the economic uh, class, would be something that would be unquestionably replicatable in Ceylon. And as you said, this was the guinea pig. Uh, they probably thought it was best to try it out here. Ceylon yes. was the model yes. colony. I, yes. I, I think uh, that that's a term that we've heard on over and over again. And so uh, it was being tested out. So a question has come in saying, do you think granting of universal suffrage as early as 1931 was a big mistake uh, when we reflect on, of course, at the time it was decided to give it at the point, but when you reflect on it, uh, considering the election results of 56, 60, 70, <laughs> wasn't it a free path for the leftists to get power? Hmm. Well, it's very interesting that someone has asked about the leftists. The leftists, the LSSP and CP, were exactly the kinds of parties that the Donnamore commissioners would ho were hoping through their constitution to bring about. They, they, this was the economic class-based political parties that they were hoping would come and would develop in Sri Lanka in the same way that, say, the Labour Party, the Liberals and the Conservatives had developed in, in, in the UK and, you know, equally other parties in Europe which were based on class and on economic uh, factors. So, in fact, that is the one part that you might say was the success. The development of the leftist parties was in fact a success of the Donnamore constitution. The problem was, was that it was the communal parties well, which did not disappear. And, and, and in fact, you know, grew stronger and stronger. So the Singhala Mahasabha, which was just a group, which then slowly but surely morphed into the uh, Sri Lankan Freedom Party, the, the All Ceylon Tamil Congress, which morphed into either, um, I've forgotten what the what, uh, Gigi Penambulan's party was called, but his party and later the, the Federal Party and so on. It was the communal parties and, and the way that they took over the, the entire um, political situation, which was the failure of the Donnamore Commission, but you constitution, but you must remember the executive committee system was there to stop. It was a power sharing system, which was meant to, even if there were communal, um, um, even if parties developed communally, still within the state council, in the executive committee system, it, the, the communities would be forced to work together as they are today in Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So an, another question is coming in from Fiumi. Uh, do you believe if communal representation system, which was introduced under the core group reforms was retained in the normal reforms, it would have made at least a bit of a difference in the series of event, events that happened later on that led to a great deal of social unrest in Ceylon. What sort of domino effect do you think it would have given effect to? The problem is, is that um, because there were not all the, the 50, uh, there was 50, but uh, there were also some appointed members from the European, what we call from the European um, community. These were planters, largely. They, because they had lobbied 
the colonial office very successfully in London because they were in, in effect British. They had lobbied to have be made appointed councillors to the state council. And it, there were six of them. And it gave them, because the council was very small, only 50, it gave them undue influence. And the thing was, was that they got together with certain um, Singhalese councillors, um, who, of whom DSN Nyker was the most important. Um, and between them, they organized to ensure that the elections uh, to the different executive committees resulted in um, a situation whereby every one of the ministers was a Singhalese. And this was called the pan singular Board of Ministers. And this totally undermined the whole idea of the power sharing executive, because now all the power had come to the Singhalese. Now, the Europeans thought they were going to get some, some nice things out of this, but they didn't. They thought they were going to get some plums of office. But what happened was the Singhalese ministers gave them nothing. They used them to, to uh, manipulate the system. But once they had all become ministers, they gave the Europeans absolutely nothing. What happened was that the Ceylon Tamils, who had been reasonably happy with the situation because they had managed to get one Ceylon Tamil as a minister, and even the Muslims and even the Burgers were reasonably happy because they thought they could have some input into the executive committee system, they all became thoroughly disillusioned and they wanted to get rid of it. And they thought, we'll do better under a Westminster model. And when you had the Westminster model came with the Solbury Constitution, it turned out to be even worse. And when that model was done away with, and you now have the French model with a with a with an elected president and a prime minister and a parliament, and I beg to state that perhaps that model is also equally unsuitable, and that it might be better if you went back to a power sharing executive as you had under the Donnemore constitution and as you have today in certain countries, Belgium, Switzerland, Northern Ireland, and sadly, of course, the Lebanon, um, where you where there is, as the Belgian who invented the co-associational model of democracy states, there either has been conflict or there is potential for conflict. It seems to me that that kind of power sharing executive and the, the system that underpins it is would be far more um, suitable for Sri Lanka. And so therefore, yes, if the executive committee system had somehow been maintained, you might not have had a lot of the problems which um, followed in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and so on. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, Ambassador M.M. Zuhair is with us, and he says, um, thank you for your interesting presentation. In your doctoral thesis, uh, you had said that the executive system um, you had described as an unsuitable vehicle for communal politics. In your presentation, you referred to the executive committee system with the limited PR added. Do you think that communal politics of the majority and minority communities in Sri Lanka can be eliminated? If not, do you have any suggestions to the committee addressing the ninth constitution of the universal franchise? Well, I think I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm just really going to repeat myself in what I've said already. I do think that a power sharing executive, which includes something like the executive committee system, um, a co-associational model of democracy, you know, as is practiced in Belgium, in Switzerland, in uh, Northern Ireland and in, in, in the Lebanon, is more appropriate to Sri Lanka because of the way that it is configured in terms of its population and its social structure than these other models which it has borrowed from Britain and now from France, which do not have those kinds of problems. Those models are very unsuitable. It needs a model which works for itself, which is built around its problems, not something which has been pasted onto it by somebody or some leaders who feel, oh, well, this is the vehicle which will give me power, right? It needs a model which will give everybody a sense of ownership and entitlement, not just that of a few. Thank you. If we, if we go back to reflecting on uh, the point that you made in your presentation, Jane, where you talked about uh, 1931, India was not independent, what could have been the outcome? It could have been a completely uh, a different scenario at that point. And a question has come in in that regard, um, asking, in such a situation, you compared us to Hong Kong, it might have been similar uh, to a situation at which uh, Hong Kong was going to be finally reunited with China. Uh, we would have been probably reunited with India. 
or united rather than reunited, united yeah. with yeah. India. Uh, could you reflect on that point? Well, it it's just seems to me, if you're looking at hypotheticals, and I don't know how useful it is to look at hypotheticals, but should one do that, it seems to me that if you look at the, the press that was um, the Indian press in the, in the 20s, 30s and 40s, there were large segments of the press, particularly in parts of South India, which were demanding that Sri Lanka or Ceylon be given to India once India was gaining independence. There was a movement that, that plainly said that, that Ceylon, because of its um, geographical closeness to, to um, India, because of the fact that, in fact, all the peoples of Ceylon, except for the Aboriginals, had most definitely come from India, and, and no one can deny that that's not true. The Sinhalese also derived their origins from India just as much as the Tamils and the um, Indian Moors, as they were called. Um, of, of course, not the burger community nor the European community, but those have shrunk to, to very small um, parts of the, of the population. So you can see that the pressure that was building up in India as it got closer and closer to independence, to have Ceylon as part of its orbit, I mean, specifically stated as part of its orbit, was very strong. Fortunately, for you know how, how that is, how karma works, Ceylon has, was part of the colonial office, it was a crown colony, and it was administered completely separately, completely separately to the countries of the in, uh, under the Indian uh, India office, that is Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, and Burma. Okay? But you can imagine how it might have been that Ceylon would have been transferred into the India office at some point, and then when the question of you know, what makes up India, yeah, what what countries get independence in you know when India is given independence? Would Ceylon have got its own independence, or would it have been shoved in with what then became India and with the partition of Pakistan into West Pakistan and East Pakistan, which is now Bangladesh? It's it's a point you can think about, right? Things, fortunately, or perhaps unfortunately, were different, and and so we have a situation today where Ceylon, right next door. I mean, as close as one can be, I mean, as close as, 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 as Britain is to the European Union, to France, from which it has just managed or is trying very hard to extricate itself, right? As close as that is Ceylon or Sri Lanka to India. And yet, and yet, who tried to invade Ceylon in 1941? The Japanese. Now, they're an awfully long way away in some respects from Ceylon, certainly much further away than India, though perhaps not as far away as Britain. But unfortunately, when a country um, considers itself to be an imperial power, it actually doesn't care how far away you are from it. If it thinks that it has a right to take you over, it will take you over. So, we have a situation now where Ceylon, Sri Lanka, is an independent country. It has been an independent country, and it appears it will be an independent country, you know, into the future for as long as the planet exists and man is on the planet. So I think we can dispense with the worry of whether India is going to take over Sri Lanka, not in the foreseeable future, at Absolutely. any case. Absolutely. Uh, if we go back to that whole area of governance that came about after uh, the reforms were introduced, um, how, uh, at the beginning, we started talking about this and we said there was a certain degree of apprehension in accepting uh, the Ronimo reforms, uh, but at the end of the day, they were implemented. And then after that, we move into various forms of constitution building and changes that are ma being made along the line. So much so that very few people even begin to realize that long before the 4th of February, 1948, Ceylonese leaders were ministers, they were, they were governing, they were involved in the process of governance. Uh, D.S. Senanayake did not uh, just become prime minister on the 4th of February, uh, 48. He had been, there had been a transition. If you could reflect on the transition, Jane. Right. Um, the ministries, uh, the seven ministries in the Donamore um, uh, constitution that the uh, Ceylonese or Sri Lankans um, had in their purview 
were agriculture, which was DSN and ICAS, transport, I think that was Sir John Cotalabala, health, which became Georgie de Silva's. Um, I'm trying to think of the others. Um, education, which um, finally became, um, oh, the father of um, education. W.W. W. W. Kananga and so on. So if you, if you look at the ministers and, and the ministries that they oversaw, these were the most radical of the ministries in, in, Sri, in Ceylon, in Sri Lanka in the 1930s and 40s. Georgie de Silva oversaw the chain of local um, hospitals called community hospitals. They still exist. A lot of them have been enlarged to become base hospitals. Um, today, you wouldn't be able to cope with the COVID um, epidemic the way you are had it not been for the work that he um, put in in the first place in bringing about this chain of local um, state-run, totally free hospitals. If you look at education, right, you wouldn't have the education system you have today if it wasn't for the work done by CWW Kanangara. Look at agriculture. You wouldn't have the agricultural system you have today if it hadn't been for what was uh, set up by DSN and ICA. And these things would never have occurred if those had been British, imperial, colonial uh, civil servants overseeing those things. These things would not have been done because though those civil servants, however good, could never see things from the point of view of the people themselves. Their masters were in London, their point of view was that of Britain, and however sympathetic they may have been to the to the um, wishes and the, the uh, demands and also what was best for the people that they ruled, they could never ever understand the country the way the people born in it and coming from it and coming from their culture could understand it. So that is why that transitional period, 1931 to 1948, was absolutely vital in keeping the stability that Sri Lanka has managed to maintain all the way through the most terrible things that have happened to it. Still, whatever it is, it still has periodically free and fair elections. It is still maintaining universal franchise, right? Um, it may have deported a number of the Indian Tamils, but the others it has given the vote to. So it, despite all of the problems that it has faced, many of which are not of its own making, it has managed to maintain some kind of stable government, changes of government, free and fair elections, on, you know, and, and it has enacted a one, two, what, three constitutions since the Donovan Constitution. So, you know, it has done remarkable things which came from this, this period in which it was able to practice governing itself in a modern setting. Because, of course, Sri Lanka had governed itself for two and a half plus thousands of years. It's not that it didn't have any government before the British turned up. It had a perfectly acceptable form of government, right? You know, it had kings, right? And like most, like most countries, it had kings and it had a, a civilization. It had different kings. It had parts under one king. Then suddenly it would be under a single king. Then it again would diversify and be under several kings and so on. But it did have a form of, of government that appeared to suit itself. It then bumped into the British Empire, sadly, or into empires, so first the Portuguese, then the Dutch, then the British Empire. It bumped into empire. It got taken over, whether it wanted to or not. And But when it came out the other side, it has managed remarkably well, given the terrible disruption that happened to it for 400 years, to survive as a single country, right, without too much of destabilization. I mean, yes, a certain amount. Um, a low level civil war, which is awful for the people in it, but doesn't seem to have an awful lot of impact on people outside Sri Lanka. It has survived. It is a survivor. Absolutely. As you, as you mentioned, the country has been very resilient uh, over a long period of time. 2,500 years of resilience has been put to the test on many occasions. And uh, the country has always been able to come out of such situations. Um, Jane, we are in our final few minutes. We'd like to reflect on some of the personalities. Uh, you did a book on Georgie De Silva, the Minister of Health. 
um, uh, you, I know, had access to his papers. You were, you knew his daughter. Um, could you, could you reflect on him? And um, a person whom you interviewed as well was Sir John Kotelavada. Uh, very few people in Sri Lanka, um, and I, I might say there may be people in Sri Lanka who are unaware of Sir John, who have. Um, well, heard of him at some point. I find situations in which people talk about D.S. Dudley and then they jump to Bandar Naika uh, and uh, Sir John gets conveniently sidelined. Um, could you reflect on those two personalities from yesteryear, please? I think you're on mute at the moment, Jane. No problem. I will yes. do, and I'll try and do it very quickly. I didn't know George personally. I lived in his house, the house that he had built called St. George's. I, um, in, the, in the main room, there was the portrait um, of himself and his wife, Agnes, on either side of the dining table. And in the evenings, um, I used to watch them talk to each other. And I know you may think, well, I must have been off my head, but I wasn't. Um, they did actually have conversations, usually quite tart conversations, in which Mrs. De Silva would um, um, tell George E. De Silva off for many of his peccadilloes, a lot of them about his sexual activities with other women, right? So, and uh, once I got tuned in to... Um, to their conversations i you know later on i found um, his wife's diaries and um, so on and i was able to therefore try and get inside his head um in the case of sir john Caldelavle, i met him that was what was different he was a real living uh, person and he was absolutely charming um he lived in an enormous house called kandawilla which is now the military academy and uh, he had an enormous uh, great circle of grass oval of grass in front of this and he would sit on a on a hansi putua with his legs up and i would sit beside him and he had two enormous peacocks that walked across this enormous circle of grass yelling at each other in very loud tones and he would hand me a, a glass of whiskey which was very very um um welcome because whiskey was very difficult to come by in those days 1973-74 and he would chatter on about what it was to be a politician a prime minister, um, a Sinhalese, a man, <laughs> a Buddhist, <laughs> uh, an, an ex-soldier, and he would—he was wonderful, and he was so open, and he was so um, disarming that I have always had a very, very um, soft spot for Sir John in in my mind. He's considered a bit of a clown because he went against the Chinese at the Bandung conference particularly Chu Lai, who ran circles around him, because Chu Lai was an intellectual and uh, Sir John Cotillavlin was most certainly not. But he was very well-meaning. Um, he had a lot of time for women. Um, and he was a very kindly um, person and a good Buddhist, oddly enough. He really was a good Buddhist. He, he really did believe. Um, so I always have very... Um, very fond memories of Sir John, and I hope at some point to to give him some kind of written um, uh, bio or at least a short, brief biography in in another book that I'm writing about about an English woman called um, called um, uh, Mrs. Uh, De Silva. She was uh, rather Mrs. Kularatna. She was the wife of P.D.S. Kularatna, Agnes. I'm hoping at some point to to bring out the the friendship between Agnes and Sir John and how it changed both, you know, both their lives. Um, but that's for the future. But like I say, yes, uh, George and Sir John, um, amongst other people who I met, um, Sir Arthur Runnersinger was most helpful to me. He was also a lovely man. Um, but there were quite a few others who I who I interviewed. A. Ratnaika, for one. Um, Dr. Wickramasinghe, the leader of the Communist Party. Peter, yeah, S.A. Wickramasinghe, Peter Kenneman, um, lots and lots of people who are now lost, lost as it were, to history. But actually, uh, they're very clear in in my mind, and I hope, if you know, at least at some point, to be able to put put down my um, my uh, um, perspectives on them in print. Colvin Ardi Silva was another person that yes, tried to believe. Yes, you. very much. Yes, Colvin and Doric. Yes, because I met Doric and Colvin at the same time when. Uh, Colvin was the Minister of Constitutional Affairs. Mm -hmm. um, N.M. Pereira. 
yeah, these were these were very um, very very helpful people to me. You also knew someone who at the time was in the opposition. I do believe he was the leader of the opposition at the time, Jaya Jayavardhana. And then yeah. later on, when you were in Sri Lanka, he goes on to become president. Yeah. What difference did you see in the personality? He goes on to become the first executive president. That's right. He had been he around did. from independence. He was, he was a stalwart of this country's governance structure over decades, yeah, six yeah. decades or so, he was at the helm, uh, mm. well, in, in, involved in being at the helm. Um, how would you how would you reflect on him as the leader of the opposition, and then subsequently you also saw him as president? Right, he was an extremely clever man, extraordinarily clever man, wily, not just clever. He was wily. He was a wily politician. It was he who has introduced this French model, which you are currently using today. Um, and he did explain to me that that was one of the things he intended to do if he got into power in 1973-74 um, when I met him. He said, this is what I'm going to do. And at the time, I thought it, would, it seemed like a good idea. Um, it is only with hindsight, as I've got older, that I've looked back and thought, mm, well, it suited him, but I don't know that it actually suited Sri Lanka. So, um, yeah, um, he was, like I say, he was an extraordinarily clever man. He was very, very patient. He was well able to wait for a long, long time, because he had to wait not just for DSN Naika to die, for SWRD Bandaranaika to die, for Mrs. Bandaranaika to lose uh, to, to, to lose an election and then her, her, her civil rights, for um, Dudley to die, because in fact he would never have become the president if Dudley had still been alive. So he was extremely patient man. He was in politics from 1941, 1942, but he finally became the president in 1978. That's an awfully long time to wait to get ultimate power. But that's what I say, he was extremely patient and extremely clever, very wily, but what he brought in, in the end, was not suitable for Sri Lanka. That's what I now believe to be the case. I didn't then, I thought perhaps it was a great idea, you know, sort of combining kingly ideas with that of the parliament, you know, trying to put the past of Ceylon or Sri Lanka in with the present or the, the future of Sri Lanka. But now I don't believe so. Now I think that power sharing is the only way. On that note, I really want to thank you profusely for taking time. Uh, you've spent a, more than one hour with us and we've gone through, we've reflected on 90 years of universal franchise. Uh, we looked at the complexities of governance and policy. Um, we looked at hypothetical situations, and you also reflected upon key personalities, personalities who you knew personally, personalities who you researched. Um, so on behalf of everyone who has joined us and on behalf of the AwareLog initiative, we are extremely thankful to you for uh, giving us of your time. I know you have a very busy schedule, and we're able to uh, fix this date um, uh, after some weeks of uh, communication. Thank you very much for giving us of your time. Uh, we're looking forward to the next book coming out. Uh, <laughs> that is something that uh, would be, and also seeing you in Sri Lanka sometime soon when uh, uh. things <laughs> calm down with the pandemic around the world. Uh, it would be amazing uh, to have personalities of your nature, Jane, because you've made um, such a seminal contribution through your work, through your research, the way you have reflected on these uh, periods. Um, which is something that is, it's, it's a norm elsewhere in other countries, of course, in the United Kingdom and elsewhere in India, especially. Uh, but this is uh, something that we really need to revive in Sri Lanka, looking at history, understanding where we come from, understanding the past, because very often history repeats itself in varied forms and manifestations, and we have to be aware of what happened. So I like the fact that you talked about power sharing, how we can, how we need to be re-examining these questions. And these are things that uh, everybody who's joining us would also agree, I'm sure, uh, are areas that we need to have due reflection. We need to be focusing on those areas. So thank you once again, Jane, for your time, uh, for your valuable thoughts and reflections. And thank you to everyone who took time to join us on the first AwareLog uh, lecture forum uh, brought to you by the AwareLog initiative. We've got a lot more things coming up. We have another session coming up in two weeks time, uh, which will focus on the Indo-Pacific, uh, and we next week, the culture site will focus on cultural capital and we look at arts and education in Sri Lanka and the fact of uh, culture. We've talked about a culture as Jane also reflected on something going back 2,500 years. It has evolved. Uh, it is also something that we need to reflect on in the current context. Uh, 
Uh, and that's what we're doing with Hasini Hapukam 3 next Tuesday evening at 6. So thank you once again, Jane, and thank you everyone for joining us. And uh, we've got participants all the way in Australia, in Laos, uh, elsewhere in the world as well. So it's very late in Australia right now. Uh, I think Nish, you're still with us. Um, Dilip is joining us from Laos and elsewhere. And so thank you to everyone who took time to be a part of uh, this event. And we'll see you again in another session of the Valor Forum. Thank you very much and have a good evening. Thank you, George. Thank you. Bye, bye one to everybody. To you too, to you too, Jane. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you, it's been much. an honor. Thank you, I've enjoyed it. Thank, Thank you. you.